Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you. We thank you for this night. We thank you that we have a blessing to come together, together to listen to your word. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you may lead me, that you give us wisdom, you may give us knowledge in order for us to apply what the word of God has for us today. And Lord, let us examine ourselves, teach us what the scriptures say, and help us to live it out, not just to listen to it, but to do it. So Holy Spirit, once again, I give you the thanks, I give you the glory, amen, that your Holy Spirit speak through me and may open our hearts at this night. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. So we've been doing a lot of, you know, reflecting in our spiritual walks, right? We've always been preaching about being devoted to the Lord, about our ABCs. But now we need to examine ourselves. We need to examine ourselves if we are walking in the light or not. Okay, because a lot of you guys are still like, I wouldn't say baby believers, but you guys are still in those early stages where the enemy comes against you guys with a lot of doubt, with a lot of confusion, with a lot of um, self-condemnation, okay? And even to the point where sometimes you're tormented or you doubt your salvation. Salvation. How many of you guys ever, uh, raise your hand if you've ever doubted your salvation? I did. I remember when I was a baby believer, that was one of the things that, wait, my, wait. Have I sinned too much? Have I lost my salvation? Have I lost the Holy Spirit? Am I still going to go to heaven? Okay, so that's one of the things where I was tormented and always confused. Now, believe it or not, there's a lot of people that believe that they're saved when they're not. This is why we have to examine ourselves. According to what? To our feelings? No. According to what? The scriptures. It's against the scriptures. So today's message I want to be talking about saved or deceived. How do I know if I'm saved? How do I know if I'm saved? And this is the most important question that every human being must answer. You want want to be my... Appreciate it. Next. Okay. So I want to give you an example. Let's say I had a long rope. Okay. You guys ever heard that tug of war rope? Remember the one that I? <laughs> yeah, the one you guys pulled me. <laughs> you didn't have to say that, you know. <laughs> okay, the long rope. Let's say that this just a little bit of it, just a little bit, represents the years that you have on Earth, and the rest of the rope represents eternity. Eternity. Think about this. That here on Earth we have a little few years. If you're lucky, you get to live up to. I think the average is like 70, 80 that people get to live up to. All right? We're just 70 to 80? I think it's less. Oh. Less? No, it's less. It's, <laughs> it's like 60s now. It's like that's 60 the average. 75. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. Damn. Really? No, that's that's really low. That's sad, though. Yeah, and that's, and you know, 150,000 people die every day. Yeah, that's a big around the world. So, that's the big answer, question that we have to answer, is that if we would die today, right, next one, if we were to die today and stand before the Lord, where would our soul go? Would it go to heaven or would it go to hell? Because that's the only two places that after death our soul is going to go. So, with all honesty, raise your hand if you were to die today. You think you would make it into heaven? Raise your hand. No? You? My hand is up. Oh. Damn. No, no, because I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know you, you raised your hand or not. No. For the people that didn't raise their hand, does that concern you? Why? <laughs> True. <laughs> you know, you know what else is gonna be hotter? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, 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 kidding. Next one. No, this is why this is why we have to examine ourselves to the scriptures, and we're gonna talk about how to know if we're saved. 
Okay. Now, I, I know that a lot of people would say, no one knows what happens after death. And there's a lot of ideologies out there that, oh, after death, then we become a butterfly. Like, you know what I'm saying, reincarnation. There's other things that say that, oh, there's going to be different heavens. So many different religions that have ideas or plans. You what? What would you say? <laughs> yeah, they're going to become a butterfly afterwards. Okay, or a cockroach. <laughs> yeah, man. That's, uh, that's, um, but here's the thing. Next one. If Jesus Christ, right, is the truth and he is God, then that means that there will be a day of judgment. So it all goes back to if Jesus is God. That's the question. If Jesus is God, then that means what? There's a heaven and there's a hell. But if Jesus isn't God, then we don't have to worry about this. But if he is, that's scary. Because that means that one day we're going to stand before God. And you guys know, on the Day of Judgment, what's going to be the book that's going to be open? The Book of Life. The Book of Life. And those who put their faith in Christ, their name will be written where? In the Book of Life. And those who did not, the Lord, what, what would the Lord say to them? Depart from me. I never knew you. So, Jesus, it all comes to the point, is Jesus God or not? Why do you think so many religions, or even atheists and all these other people, try to disprove that God, or excuse me, that Jesus isn't God? Because if it is true, it's terrifying. So, next one. It all comes to that point. Hebrews 9, 27 says, Men are destined to die once and then to be judged. So Jesus said that people will be judged based on what they did on their life here, on their lifestyle, their actions, their words. In fact, the scriptures say that we will be judged by every word that we have said. Every word. That's crazy. And the Bible says that all of it is written on the Day of Judgment. So, next one. That Day of Judgment can happen any day or any time. So how can a Christian know if he or she is saved? How can a Christian know if they're saved? For those who did uh, raise their hands, you say, I'm for sure 100% know that I'm going to be in heaven. How do you know? How do you really know that you're saved? Not you, Connor. How do you know if you're saved? What do you mean by that? You repent and believe in the gospel. And change from your old sinful habits. You believe in what Jesus died. He died for your sins. And you have a repentant heart. Is that okay? Yes, that's good. Nice. Now... He said, repent and believe in the gospel. Now, in fact, repentance is not what saves you. It's a response that we do to what Jesus did for us. Now, for those who are saying, like, oh, I don't know if, if I'm saved, the scripture says that it is possible for us to know if we're saved. It is. Think, man, you think God is such a good guy that he's going to be like, you know what, my children, I've died, I've given them everything, but now they're not going to know if they're saved or not. Is that a good father? No. A good father is going to be like, you're saved. You're right. You'll make it. You're straight. Yeah, you're straight. On judgment day, I mean, that's still scary, but he's still going to be like, I know you. So there's no need for us to be scared. To a point, to, to an extent, we do have to have the fear of the Lord. But the Bible says that on judgment day, there will be people with boldness saying, I know him. And he knows me. Think about that boldness. If you're saved, you can know right now, if you were to die, you'd be in heaven. Think about that. We're not like Muslims. We're Muslims, they don't know if they're saved. Okay, they don't. In fact, that's why they have to keep on doing good works. That's why they have to keep on praying five times a day. That's why they have to fast. That's why they have to prove themselves to their God that they'll be good enough to enter heaven. Guess what? We ain't going to do none of that. We can know if we're saved according to the scriptures. Next one. So we're going to examine ourselves. Y'all got your notes? If you have your notes, take them off. We're going to examine ourselves now. 
Don't examine the person next to you. Do not examine your mom or your dad or your sibling. Do not examine your boyfriend or girlfriend. Examine yourself. Examine yourself if you are in the truth and if you are in salvation. Okay? So, you guys ready for the test? You guys ready? <laughs> okay. Signs. Signs is that you are saved. Let's go to 1 John. Let's go to 1 John in the Bible. All right, here we go. First point, very first, first point, that if you are saved, if you recognize yourself as a sinner before a holy God, you recognize that you've sinned against God. You've broken His commandments. Verse 8 says this, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So, if you're here, you know, the question that I asked you guys, do you think you're a good person? Okay. Raise your hand if you think you're a good person. No, you're a horrible, you're a horrible brother. Well, I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> <laughs> well, technically, I'm made a good person, but you'll get to that later. Come out of it. He said you'll get to that later. Oh, yeah, he said you'll get to that little bro. No. And that's a good point, little bro. <laughs> uh, anyways, okay, verse 8, look it says right here. If we say that we have no sin, okay, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So if you're here and you're saying, you know what, I'm good, I don't need to repent, I'm I, I'm good, there's no need for God, I'm not a bad person. You see, that is deceiving ourselves. Okay, so my question to you is this, what is your attitude towards your sin? Do you recognize that you have sinned against the Holy God? Yes or no, examine yourself. Do you recognize it? You don't justify it, you don't defend it, you don't make excuses for it, yet you recognize that you've sinned against the Holy God. Next one. Like what's your attitude towards sin? So let's use the sin of pornography. Okay? Is your attitude in, in this is like, I know this is sin and I need to turn away from it. And you ask the Lord for forgiveness and you say, I'm done with it. That's repentance. That's recognizing I've sinned against the Holy God that I need to turn away from my sin. Or, is your attitude like, eh, whatever, I don't care. I'll keep doing whatever I want to do. Oh, I'll keep on sleeping around. I'll keep on drinking and doing my, living the party life. What's your attitude towards your sin? Is it, I need to change my ways? Is it, I need to repent? I need God's forgiveness. Or is it, I don't care. You see the difference? Your attitude towards sin will reveal to you a lot where your heart is at. If you are truly saved, you're going to want to turn, turn away from sin. Forgive me, Lord. Help me change. That is a true sign of a true believer. Someone that doesn't have the Holy Spirit could care less. Think about this. I could say this from my own life, that when I wasn't a believer, when I didn't have the Holy Spirit, I could be in sin, and I wouldn't care. I'd keep on doing it. But when I gave my life to Christ and I received the Holy Spirit and I went back to my sin, there was something different. Something in me was like, I, I can't do this anymore. It's disgusting. It's, there's been a change in my heart. Think about this. If you go back to the party life and you feel uncomfortable, feel like there's something, I, I, don't, I don't belong here. It's the Holy Spirit inside of you. That's telling you, this is not your place no more. That's a good sign if your attitude in your mind has been, what? Changed. Renewed. By who? The Holy Spirit. So, what's your attitude towards your sin? Are you fighting against it? Do you hate it? Are you at war with it? Or do you enjoy it? Or you could care less of your sin? A true believer will be at war with their sin. Next one. Number two. With that, not only you repent, but you desire and seek to live a life of obedience towards God. So my question to you is this. If I were to go around and ask everyone here, do you desire to obey God? 
Do you desire to obey God? Not just simply desire it, do you do it? Do you obey the Lord? Verse 3 of that same chapter. We know that we have come to know Him. Who? Christ. If what? If we keep what? His commandments. How do I know if I know the Lord? Do you keep His commandments? Verse 4. Anyone who says, I know Him, but he doesn't do what he tells him, he is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. So when we read the scriptures, when we read the commandments, do you obey it? Do you do it? Do you desire to obey the Lord? Take a second there. Take a minute. Examine. If I were to ask you, do you truly desire to do God's will? Would that be a yes or no? If it's a yes, you're saying, Lord, deep down, I want to love you. Deep down, I want to obey you. Deep down, I want to know you. I want to get rid of my sin. If that's your attitude, that's good news. Very good news. Because someone who doesn't have the Holy Spirit could care less about the Scriptures, could care less about obeying God. Do you think someone who doesn't have the Holy Spirit wants to obey God? No. What does the Bible say about them? They're dead in their sins. They're following their fleshly desires, which, which leads to what? Death, not to life. So, is your desire not only fighting against your sin, but to obey Him? If that's a yes, that's good news. Next one. So, with the commandments, the Ten Commandments, are we saved by obeying it though? Are we saved by obeying the commandments? No, we're not. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. If we're not saved for obeying the commandments, if we're not saved by obeying the commandments, then what's the whole point of obeying the commandments? Mm, Someone dev him up, bro. Okay, next one. Now, for example, the Ten Commandments, right? Raise your hand if you ever lied. You all are liars. You guys have never lied? Yeah? Yeah? You're a liar. Raise your hand if you ever stolen. If, uh, <laughs> raise your hand if you ever blasphemed God's name. What? Blaspheme. Like in said Jesus Christ as a cuss word? Yeah, you've done it. Good. Have you ever lusted? Yes, all of us have. Okay. Now, the Bible says this. The Bible says this. If you just broke just one commandment, y'all broke how many? One, two, three. Y'all broke five of them. If the Bible says this, if you already, if you broke one, just one. You're done. You deserve hell. So if you've lied, sorry, Jerry, you're going to hell. <laughs> including, including me. I'm like, all of us have sinned against God. The scripture says we all have fallen short to God's glory. Glory, yeah. Next one. So if our obedience and our good works don't get us to heaven, what does? Yes. It's grace. It's called... One word, amazing grace. Everyone say amazing grace. Okay, let's go to uh, the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. We're doing a lot of Bible to them. We are in a Bible study. All right, Ephesians chapter 2. Do you guys got it? Amen? Amen, amen, amen. All right, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says this. As for you, who is he talking to us? To us. You were what? You were dead in your sins and your trespasses. Verse 2, in which you lived when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Who's that? Satan. So he's saying, we used to be like the world. We used to follow the ways of the devil. And then right there, the spirit who now works in those who are disobedient. Okay? Verse 3, all of us have also lived among them at one time, satisfying the desires of our flesh and following its desires and the thoughts. 
like others, we were by nature deserving of what? Of God's wrath. Verse 4. But God. Everyone say, but God. Okay. But who is rich in mercy because of what? His great love for us. Verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, he made us alive together with Christ. Mm. By grace, you are what? Saved. Saved. Verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7. To show in the age to come the uncomparable riches of his grace expressed in his king kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8. This is the, the highlight. For by grace, what? You have been saved through faith, not by yourselves. It is a gift of who? Of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Verse 10, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Next one. It is by grace we have been saved. You know what's cool like, that I noticed is like, you notice how it's like, Amen. And it is by grace you have been saved. Grace. What does grace mean? What does grace? This is an example of grace. Sister. Let's say my sister slaps me. Okay. Let's say I just make you mad. You guys need, a, you guys are, some of you guys are visual learners. Yeah. 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 All right. Don't do it too hard. Let me get a close up on this. All right. I look with my left hand. Jared, I know you want to start moving. Come on. Oh, that wasn't that bad. All right, my turn. <laughs> so, is that, this example of this analogy, right? my sister slapped me. What she truly deserves is for me to slap her back. But I won't. I won't. Because I'll go in trouble. But by me not slapping her back, that's me having mercy on her. Although she deserves it, I'm having mercy. Grace is this. My sister slaps me. Not only do I have mercy on her by not slapping her back, but grace is that you slap me, but now I'm going to give you a good gift. That's the difference mercy and grace. Mercy is God not giving us on what we deserve. Grace is this. God giving us something that we do not deserve. Amazing grace. And that's what Jesus did. Remember, we go back, next one, last one, the last one, the last one, the last one, the last slide. Okay? Okay. <laughs> like others, <laughs> that took you a minute. Like others, we were by nature what? Deserving of what? Of God's wrath. Why? Because God's holy. It's the fear of the Lord. God's holy. God's perfect. So, every human being has sinned against God. We've broken His commandments. We all deserve hell and of His wrath. That's what hell is. Hell is God's wrath. Do you guys know that? It's God's wrath against those who have sinned against Him. Then, what did Jesus do? Next one. It is by amazing grace you have been saved through faith. What's faith? What's faith? Jack preaching this. What's faith? No, not you. Don't answer. <laughs> not you either. What's up? Yes. You're putting your faith in someone else. Trust. Trusting. You have been saved through faith. Faith in what? Jesus. And what Jesus did for you on the cross. It's like what Jesus said, like uh, when he came to uh, like the man, the, the man, like after he resurrected, he came to the man who he's like, I won't believe in you, uh, in you unless I put my hand through your, your wrist. And he's like, blessed be the brothers who do not see me, but still believe. Amen. You see, it is a gift from who? God. From God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So you can't say, I got myself to heaven. It was my good deeds that got myself to heaven. No. No. It is by one man, Jesus Christ, what he did for us on the cross. By grace, you have been saved. Not by works. Next one. So, 
Remember when I said that what's the whole point of obeying God's commandments if that doesn't save us? That's what Connor said. We do not obey to be saved. We obey because we are saved. It's a big difference. We do not obey to be saved. Like the Muslims, they have to obey to be saved. We obey because God already showed his love for us. You do not obey to be loved by God. You are loved by God. So that's why you want to obey. The Lord loved us. Now think about this. Because sometimes, this is real talk. Some of you guys struggle with so much condemnation and shame. If God loved you while you were a sinner, okay? When you were living in the world, doing your own ways. If God loved you, then how much more now that you belong to him? Does he love you? How much more now that you're a daughter and a son of Christ? How much more? Exactly. How much more? That's why the Bible says in Romans, there is no condemnation to those who belong to who? Belong to who? Who do we belong to? Jesus Christ. We do not obey to be loved by God. We love, or oh, God loves us. That's why we want to obey. Next one. So, as a true born again Christian, we will want to obey and do God's will. That's the two points. That's the second point. Do you want to do God's will? Do you want to obey God's will? Okay, now let's examine ourselves. Take a second there. Raise your hand if you want to obey God. Okay? If you want to do His will. You see? That's been a true change in the heart. Next one. Now, to the Christians who are struggling with sin. To, for the struggling Christians. Okay? The reason why I want to bring this point up because I remember when I gave my life to Christ... My life was changed. My, my mind was renewed. But there were still some certain habits where the Lord was still dealing with me. And I remember that, for example, for me, it was the sin of pornography. And although I gave my life to the Lord, and although I dedicated my life to Him, there was still a hook where the enemy had me. The enemy had me. Where, it, I'm going to be so honest with you guys, it would torment me. I remember the times that I would fall, or I would give in to sin, and... I, I'd be crying for hours. I'd be crying for hours because I've sinned against God. And I remember that in me, there was a fight in me. I would condemn myself. How can God love me? How can God forgive me after everything that He has done for me? And it was a struggle. It was a fight. It was a fight with that. Now the Holy Spirit has set me free from that. But then to those who are, I know a lot of us are new in the faith, and it's still a fight in certain things in, our, in some areas in our life. I want to give you guys an example. Next one. For example, let's say that you have a dad. I hope, yeah, I'm pretty sure we all have dads. Okay? And let's say that, <laughs> of course, yeah, it's obvious. You have a heavenly father. Okay? Um, let's say... That you messed up and you, let's say, let's say you sin against your father, your earthly father, okay? And you say, Dad, I'm going to be doing chores all day. I'm going to clean the bathroom. I'm going to sweep. I'm going to wash the dishes. I'm going to do everything, everything to make it up to you. Can I still be your son? What would a good father will say? I know what my dad would say. You know what my dad would say? My, my dad would say this, bro. Next one. <laughs> my dad would say this, bro. Yes, son, but make sure you wash the bathroom. <laughs> now, a good father, okay, a good father would say this. Next one. My dad's good too, by the way. I'm saying. You can do all these works and good deeds, but that would not change the fact that you are still my son. You see, that's the way with God. That when we sin against him, okay, 
no, there is no good deeds. There are no prayers. There are no amount of time that you read the Bible that will ever make it up to God. Never. You see, you can't make it up to God. Everything that you've done in your past, you can't make it. Lord, I'll make it up to you. No, you can't. You can't. Just come to the cross and say, Lord, forgive me. Let him do it for you. And after all those times that I've given to sin, I'd always, I remember I would be in my prayer room and I'd say, Lord, do you still love me? I, d I doubted God's love. And I would say, do you still love me after so many times that I've sinned against you? You know what the Lord every time would say? Get up, son. Get up. You're loved. Because of what Jesus did for me on the cross. You see, Jesus knew that you and I, we were going to sin against him. That we were going to backslide. That we were going to sin against him. That I've, I've sinned against the Lord. This is what I say to the Lord. I say, Lord, there's no way that I can make this up to you. There's no way. No way that I can pay you for my sin. But to come to the cross. Say, Lord, I confess my sin to you. Forgive me and help me to change. And the Lord still calls me his son. That's amazing grace. So to those who are maybe, I don't know where you are right now in your spiritual life, but if there's a sin that you know that you haven't let go of yet, and it's a fight, you do know that the Lord is for you. It's the, it's the strength that we get from our Lord that helps us to defeat, defeat sin, to help us overcome what the enemy has done against us. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to overcome sin. You know, we need God's Spirit to overcome sin. So it would be hypocrisy of God's side if we are asking Him to help us overcome sin and not give us His Holy Spirit. So when we come to Him and say, Lord, I have given in to sin. I have fallen away. I have, I'm getting cold again. Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit, guide me. Holy Spirit, transform me. Holy Spirit, renew me. Holy Spirit, sanctify me. Holy Spirit, justify me. Holy Spirit, lift me up. And it is by the Spirit of God that gives us that justification that you and I still belong to the Lord regardless of the habitual sins that we may be going through, the Lord still loves His children. A good father will say this, your works still define you, but the work of Jesus Christ defines who you are. Next one. So, this is what our good Heavenly Father says to us. Matthew 7, 11. If you being evil, okay, he's talking to the parents. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more would your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? So, all of us, we've all done evil in God's sight. And we know to give good gifts to our children. How much more? The perfect Heavenly Father. The perfect Heavenly Father knows to give to his children for those who ask him. Man, I want to take, take a second there and just reflect how much of a good God that we have. Thank God that we don't have a God of the Muslims, of the Hindus, that they have to do things to prove themselves to their God. Jesus proved me through the cross that I'm worthy of the Father because of what Jesus did for me. That's amazing grace. Next one. And when we sin, we have an advocate. Who's our advocate? The Holy Spirit. First John chapter 2, verse 1. I write this to you so that you do not sin. And then she's out. If anyone sins, we have an advocate. That means a lawyer, a helper. Before the Father, Jesus Christ, the just. Verse 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And do not only... And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. It is Jesus Christ. We have a lawyer. 
So on judgment then, right? On judgment then, when we stand before him, those who put their trust in Jesus, you know who's going to be a lawyer? Who's going to be a lawyer? Jesus Christ. Because when we stand before him, remember, have this picture. He's a judge. What does a judge have to do? Bring judgment. So, if there is no way for you and me to pay for our sins, who did it for us? Jesus. So Jesus Christ will be our advocate, our lawyer. Say, this man and this woman put their faith in what I did for them in the cross. We are justified. Next one. Through the work of Christ. Through the work of Christ. Third sign, if you're saved. You do not practice sin. This is a huge, huge thing. What do, what do you guys think about mean by practice? Practice sin. How many of you guys were athletes one day? Okay, what would you do? In before games? Study, Study film. No, 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 no. What would you guys do in preparation for the game? Practice. You would practice. Practice what? The plays. Have practice of uh, practicing the plays. The film. The weight room. You guys would practice in order for to have a good outcome. Okay. Now the Bible says practicing sin. How does that correlate to sin? Think. Think. Yes. You intentionally, willingly. Planning on it, you plan, you make it a habitual thing, you defend it, you keep it in secret, and you practice it. Next one. First John, chapter three. Let's go to chapter three, verse seven. First John, chapter three, verse seven. First John, chapter three, verse seven. It says this. You guys have it? Okay. It says this. Dear children, look at the very first thing that they said. Do not let yourself be fooled. Don't, let, don't be fooled. Don't be deceived by anyone. So it's telling, it's warning us. Pay attention to the scriptures. He who does what is right is what? Righteous. Just as he is righteous. Verse 8. He who practices sin is who? Of the devil. Because the devil sinned from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the work of the devil. Verse 9. None of those born of God will continue to sin. Because the seed of God remains in them. They cannot continue sinning. Because they have been born of God. Verse 10. This is how we know. Okay. Who are the children of God. And who are the children of the devil. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is he who does not love his brother and his sister. Do not be deceived. Now, practicing sin, what does that mean? Intentionally planning, intentionally living in sin. After warning, after warning, after warning, if you have no desire to change, if you have no desire to give up the worldly pleasures, if you have no desire to give up addictions, you have no desire to make a change, you're not born of God. This is why people who do not have the Holy Spirit could care less about, could care less about the church things. They don't want to be there in the first place. You hear what I'm saying? People who don't have the Holy Spirit could care less about the book. They want to live their own life. Someone born of, born of God will want to do what is right. Obey. Will want to do what is righteous. Will do righteous before God. Next one. See, practicing sin is a huge thing. Now I want to give you guys an example. Okay? Do you guys know this animal? Armenia. Uh, don't. What is it called? Yeah. So this, they're one of the, one of the most cleanest animals in the world. 
And they absolutely hate getting be, being dirty. They absolutely hate it. And if they do get dirty, they'll go and get washed real quick. They absolutely hate it. Okay, if they fall into the dirt. Next one. Now, what about a pig though? A pig, what? He loves to get into the dirt. He loves to get muddy. He loves to just, you know, they bath in mud. I don't know if you know that, but it's crazy. Yeah, they ain't bathe in love. They enjoy it. They have no concern of getting out of the mud because they enjoy it and they want to be there. Okay, next one. Okay, now this is an example. Okay, if you truly have the seed of God, if you truly have the Holy Spirit, you may, yeah, give in to sin, but you will not enjoy it. You will not enjoy it. In fact, if you give in to sin, there's going to be inside of you a pull. And we'll say, I cannot do this anymore. This is wrong. This is not the same lifestyle anymore. You won't enjoy it. Like that first animal in Armenia. They fell into the mud, but they're not going to stay in the mud. They're going to get out and get washed. Same is with the believer. They may fall into sin, give in to sin, but they're not going to stay there. They're going to what? Go to the Lord and repent. Confess their sins. Someone that doesn't have the Holy Spirit, they're going to fall into sin. But are they going to want to give it up? Are they going to want to change? In fact, they enjoy it. You see, that's a big difference. Someone who's a child of God and someone who's a child of the devil. Child of God is this. You would desire righteousness because of who? The one inside of you. Who is this? The Holy Spirit. So examine yourself. Come on. I know some of you have tried to go back to your sin. How does it feel? How does it feel when you go back? Do you enjoy it? Or is there something that gets bothered inside of you? Maybe you may enjoy it that night, that day, but later, maybe the next day or the following day, you're going to feel like, oh, I've sinned. You're going to feel a fight. You're going to feel what? Grief. Of who? The Holy Spirit. I know it was wrong for me to do that. It was no, it was wrong for me to go out there. It was, I know it was wrong for me to give in to the sin. This is the scary part, though. This is, real, this is real talk. This is the scary part. If you have no remorse, that means your heart has gotten hardened. It's hard. If you can say, you know what, guys, screw this, man. I can, I'm going to live out my own life, and I'm going to keep on living the party life and do whatever I want, that is very dangerous because then you'll be practicing sin. And that means your heart has hardened. That's very dangerous. And it is only by the power of the Holy Spirit that you can soften your heart. Because sin, that's what it does. Sin hardens your heart. So, my question to you is this. Do you practice sin? Or do you deny it? Next one. Which one are you? An Armenian or a pig? Biblically speaking, okay? <laughs> Biblically speaking. Next one. Point number four, if you know if you're saved, knowing the divinity of Jesus Christ, that he's 100% man, but he's also 100% God. Now, why do I say that? Because there's so many cults that say that Jesus is not God. Next one. For example, Islam, Mormonism, Jehovah Witnesses, uh, yep, Buddhism, all these other religions believe in Jesus Christ. But what do they say? He's just a teacher. No. Dude, I don't know why he does that. He? I don't know why he does that. He does. For example, Mormons, they call themselves Christians. Jehovah Witnesses, they call themselves Christians. Islam, they say, oh, we believe in Jesus Christ. Peace be upon him, right? Prophet, prophet Jesus Christ. They will tell you that. Oh, we respect, we love Jesus Christ. Yet, what is it that makes the difference between us? They don't believe Him, that He is God. Same thing with Mormons. 
They believe in a different Jesus. Same thing with Jehovah's Witnesses. They believe in a different Jesus. Come on. Y'all ever have those Jehovah's Witnesses that come to your door? And I debate them in a, in a loving way. And it, it's, twisted, it's twisted scriptures in there. They believe in the New World Translation, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and the Mormons, they believe in what? The Book of Mormon. And the new, another New Testament of Jesus Christ, which is garbage, by the way. It goes against the scriptures. So, another sign that you are true in, this, in the faith, that you're saved, is that you recognize that Jesus is God. So do you recognize that Jesus is God, yes or no? Okay, that's good. First John chapter 2, verse 23, No one who denies the Son, Jesus, has a Father. He who recognizes the Son also has what? The Father. So, if you believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, you are saved. In fact, if you confess it with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and that He rose from the dead, you will be saved. It's scripture. Next one. And I know that none, none of us here are part of those cults, but those people believe that they're saved. They believe it. It all goes back to the question, is Jesus God or not? He is. He is. Last point. You're not ashamed of the Jesus Christ. Examine yourself. When it comes to sharing the gospel, when it comes to talking about your faith, not only talking about it, living it out. Can others see Christ in you? You're not ashamed of the gospel by living it out through your actions. Next one. Here's an example. Okay, I know some of you guys are sports fanatics here. <clears throat> the Bears, right? Okay. I've known fans that are willing to be in freezing temperatures to support a team. They will dance. They will yell. They will chant. They will do everything for a team that could lose. They, don't, they do not care what will happen or will be the result. In fact, they would go to the extreme and even fight the other team, the other fans. Next one. Y'all know what I'm talking about when it happens in soccer, right? For example, right, the team of the devil. These people, right, these people will do what? To the extreme to defend their team with punches over a team that what? Can lose. A team that doesn't even know them. They don't even know you. Yeah, you're here debating about it. They could care less, bro. You know what I'm saying? They don't know you. I'm sorry, kind of, the Bears don't know you. Actually, I met the head coach. Of <laughs> I guess he knows you. He knows me. For everyone else, right? Okay? I have met people that are willing to spend hours supporting a team that doesn't even know they exist. Dress up for it. Scream. Dance. Yell. Yeah. Support it for a team that could lose. I'm pretty sure you guys know where I'm going with this. Now, <laughs> the best team in Mexico. You know, when I stand before God, when I stand before, on Judgment Day, I'm going to ask him, what's the best team in Mexico? <clears throat> it is. Everyone say this, my beautiful. Now, I know some people that will defend their team even after they get clapped. Even after they get clapped. That's called loyalty, brother. They will defend their favorite team and show their pride for them even when they get destroyed. I kid you not. Sorry, Kevin. I have to put you on the spot. When they got clapped. When I say clapped, they got clapped. Okay? 8-2 by Bayern. I was trying, just for fun, I mess around with them. 
I was messing around with him. He's like, okay, who has the most trophies over? You know, he's defending it. He's defending his team that lost. He ain't going to hold back. He's going to debate you, okay? Okay? He's going to defend the team because he loves, he loves his team, although they suck, okay? That, but that time, okay? I know they're good now, I think. Now, correlate that with the, with the things of God. I know people that are willing to do all of this for a team, but yet they don't do that for God. They won't defend it. They won't talk about it. They won't study it. They won't be passionate about it. Come on, man. Y'all know, know the men that y'all, they go to the games. They're so passionate. Yet, when it comes to the things of God, they don't care. Why? Those who are not ashamed of the gospel will defend it, live it, preach it, live by it. Even laying down their life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see? That is another huge sign that you are not ashamed of the gospel if you're willing to preach about it and to live it through your actions. Matter of fact, Jesus said this. Next one. That. Next one. Luke 9, 26. Those who are ashamed of me. This is Jesus talking. Those who are ashamed of me, in my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when He comes in glory. So what is this saying? If you're on earth, are you really ashamed? You're like, yeah, I don't want to be... I, I still want to be have a foot in the church, but also a foot in the world. Yeah, I mean, I'm a Christian, but I still disagree with so many things in the Bible. Yeah, I'm a Christian, but, you know, there's things that I have a problem with. Mm -mm -mm -mm. You're either 100% in or 100% out. There's no in between. Y'all know what I'm saying? Jesus said this, you either are for me or you're against me. That is the way. That Jesus taught this. Now, if you have beef with that, you take it up to God. Well, not to me. That's what the scriptures say. Jesus said, deny yourself. Deny your sinful desires. Deny your sinful ideologies. And submit to the word of God. That's what the, word, the scriptures say. Because if you're here, and you're like, you know what? I'm a sh I don't want to be considered with the Christians. A cult. I don't want to be part of them. Where is the shame of me? I will be ashamed of them on the day of judgment. <clears throat> Hint, I don't want to be that guy. Then the day of judgment, God is like, you? I didn't know you. You never knew me. Depart from me. Because you were ashamed of him. But where are those men and women today? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. That will preach it, live by it, have reverence for it, have respect for it, and don't care what the world says about them. Because those who make the decision to follow Christ, the world will hate you. You guys get to that. If you follow Christ, the world will hate you. Because culture and society are going this way, while what? Christians are walking the opposite way. Jesus said this, if you're my disciples, the world will hate you. That means that you will lose friends. That means even your parents will disown you. That means that even siblings will be against you. I'm telling you, some, most of you are the only believer in your family. Some of you guys have gone through the hatred and the hardship of your own family turning against you guys. Yes or no? Yes. And even to the point, for example, if a Muslim comes to Christ, they're kicked out of their own household. You guys know that? They're kicked out of their own household. They'll be disowned. And I've seen so many testimonies of a lot of them coming to Christ. And a lot of them lose their life for that. Whoever's ashamed of me will be ashamed of them. Next one. So these five points. 
if you are saved, you recognize yourself as a sinner before the holy God, then you desire to seek and live a life of obedience towards God's will. Number three, you don't practice sin. And number four, you know the divinity of Christ, that you believe that He is God, and you're not ashamed of Christ. Those are the five points that to know if you are saved or not. Because all the things are impossible to do. Impossible if you do not have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the ticket to heaven. Guess what? If you have the Holy Spirit, you're going to heaven. If you have the Holy Spirit, you're going to heaven. You guys hear me? If you have the Holy Spirit, you're going to heaven. Well, Manny, how do I know if I have the Holy Spirit? If you see these five in your life. Do you see these five in your life? Yes or no? Just be straight up with yourself. Yes or no? And if you see some of these, maybe you're saying, Manny, I only see, I only see one or two of these. That's good. That's good. There need, don't need to panic. That means that there's areas that the Holy Spirit still needs to work in your life. But if you do not see any of this, make the decision today to give your life to the Lord. To say, Lord, I don't see any of this in my life. Change me. Give me a new heart that will be for you. Next one. Okay? So, if you do not see any fruit in one of these, re in one of these areas, there is good news. You say, Holy Spirit, help me to grow in this area. For example, if it's the area of not being ashamed of the gospel, say, Lord, help me to grow in that area. Or if it's in living sin out of your life, Holy Spirit, help me to turn away from my sin. Or if it's being more preaching on the gospel, okay? Whatever area that may be that you lack in, ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you help me in this area. Because ultimately, it's the Spirit of God that does the work inside of you. It is the Spirit of God that does the work inside of you that changes you. As a believer, for six, seven years, there's only one way that I've seen changes in my life. Only one way. Just one. That is this. When I open that book and I say, Lord, let your word transform me. Change me. And it wasn't until I was opening that book and praying with it that my life changed. That I started to see my lifestyle change. The way that I talk, the way that I move, the way that I walk, the way that I think, the way that I live. My life was changed. When I said, Lord, I deny my simple ways. Let your word change me. And that's when my life changed. Next one. So pray and ask to God to help you to improve those areas. And if you don't see any of those, you can do that today. Raise your hand if you see one of those in your life. Raise your hand. That's good. And it doesn't stop there. You know, when you give your life to Christ, it's not, that's it. A one-time decision. You keep growing. In fact, James says, you work out your salvation. You work it out. Meaning, you ought to be growing. You ought to be growing in the faith. You ought to be seeing fruit. You have to be getting closer with the Lord. And yes, we go through hardships. Yes, we go through tests and tribulations. But all of that should be making us stronger in the faith. Leading us closer to Him. Only to those who are submitted to Him. So examine yourself right now. Am I seeing those five points in my life? Yes or no? Take a minute. Examine yourself. Don't think for your folks. Do not think for your friend. Examine yourself. Am I seeing these points play out in my life? If not, say, Lord, transform me and use me for your glory.
We're going to pray. If you are seeing some fruit in your life, thank Him. But if there's one area or more that you want to improve in, say it. Go back to the, the point of the five. Say, Lord, help me to improve in this area, Holy Spirit. Help me to improve in letting go of sin. Help me to improve in having a desire to obey you. Help me to have, not be ashamed of the gospel. Examine yourself. Where are your weaknesses spots? And say, Lord, help me to grow in that, in that area. Okay? And if you are here and you haven't seen any of that, ask him to give you a new heart. To change your ways. Let's pray. Father, we, as we finish and we close off this message, we know that you, Lord, you love us, that you are for us. But as we, as we examine ourselves, Holy Spirit, we pray that if my brothers and sisters here are lacking strength in one of these areas, that it is by your love and it is by your mercy and grace that you will help them to be strengthened in the area, whether that be overcoming sin whether it be living a life of obedience, whether it be not having shame of the gospel and recognizing that you are God, help my brothers and sisters, O oh God, to live by your word, to see the fruits in their life that the Holy Spirit is in them. And if there's any doubt or is there any condemnation that they're not saved, Holy Spirit, the scripture tells us very clear that we are saved by grace. We're saved by amazing grace. So Father, and if there's anyone here who doesn't see any of these signs in their life, but are, are willing to make the decision to start today, to give their life to you. Father, I pray that their hearts may be softened and that your Holy Spirit may enter them and that your Holy Spirit may transform them, renew them, and make them new, a new creation. And Father, I pray right now for all of us here that we may keep on growing in our faith as we keep examining ourselves according to the Scriptures. We thank you, and we all say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Any questions or any comments? Any questions or any comments?